Hi, in this session of uh, Criminal Justice 436, Crime in the Media, we'll be discussing um, some, what I, what I call the syntax of film, or some of the conventions of film, the language of film that we use to do film analysis. Okay, when we talk about um, reading a film, sometimes it's difficult uh, simply because it it seems that films are so easy to understand. Um, and in fact, this is one of the issues that I frequently see in students' papers about crime films is that they tell me about the plot of the film or about a particular character's personality, but they don't... Um, kind of fly up above the film and do film analysis and we would call that um, kind of a sociological point of view where we look at the elements of the film and how they're all brought together to craft a particular narrative to create a particular story to reflect particular cultural values um, we want to begin to learn how to do film analysis not just simply enjoy crime as it's depicted in film so we want to learn to do what um, Christian Metz uh, is does and asks us to do, um, to not um, try to easily explain a film, but to try to understand film elements and be, begin to analyze film as a cultural product. To do this, we need to remember that film is language. Um, if you remember a long time ago, we talked about uh, the signs, the signifiers, and the signifieds. And um, what that was was that was a, a very, very brief introduction to Sussor's um, work on semiotics. He developed, he was a Swiss linguist who developed um, a discipline that's now called a semiotics. Basically, um, again, just to review, what he said was that meaning is made through the interpretation of signs. And a sign can be anything. Um, a sign can be a sound, it can be a letter, it could be a symbol, it could be a color. Um, and in film, this is really important because it could be particular movements, a particular setting, um, clothing. All of these things um, have uh, particular meanings that we attach to them. So a sign can take many, many different forms. Uh, we call these forms signifiers. And these signifiers signify particular concepts. Now, those concepts, according to Shashore, isn't they're not exactly objects. Um, I might think, uh, see the word clothes, and I might think clothes, but he's really talking about that mental image that's produced um, and how I interpret that mental image, not the actual clothes that I'm wearing. It's, it's a, a bit of a complex um, uh, idea, but again, he's talking about making meaning out of things uh, that we hear that we don't necessarily assign meanings to and ordinarily. Now, if you think back, I talked about an alien assignment. Uh, and in that, I asked people to draw what came to their mind when I said the word alien, knowing that most uh, everyone in the class had not seen an alien um, prior to that. Um, and they were all very, very similar. So that would be alien would be a, a signifier. And there's a signified or a concept, a mental concept that's produced from that. All of these concepts work together, and the fact that we shared, and in almost every class is, our aliens look alike, the fact that we share some kind of idea of what that uh, sign signifies, of, of what we see, we see the same thing, alien, and it looks the same, means that all of these meanings are culturally bound, that they are embedded in our society in a particular way, and that's how we come to understand each other. So film is language, and language helps us make meaning of the world around us is basically what it is. And we're expanding the definition of what language is to mean sound, visuals, um, color. Uh, I like this cartoon. He says, now this should clear things up around here, <laughs> where he's actually had to write on everything, what what the object really is, when in actuality you can look at the object and see what it is. It's a bit obscure, but I thought it was funny. So you can just indulge me by uh, laughing at that cartoon, whether you think it's funny or not. But again, the point is, film is language, and we're going to be looking at the syntax or the language of film. Okay, remember, too, that a lot of times um, we assign multiple meanings 
to the same sign. So remember when I said the word pig can mean multiple different things. Uh, we do this to visual uh, signs as well. So it's not just a word that might have multiple meanings. It's not just a particular um, sound that might have multiple meanings, but particular images have multiple meanings as well. If I see this image, think about what comes to mind very quickly. What's the first image that comes to your mind? I grew up in, in near West Virginia, and so um, we saw this a lot. A coal, a coal train uh, or a train carrying coal would come to my mind um, if I saw this image. But in a different context, this image might mean something else. It might signify something completely different uh, in a film than simply a train carrying coal. Say we were, in a, we were watching a film, and this scene, the kissing couple, was followed by the train entering the tunnel. Now, this is a little risque, but we all have a different interpretation of what the meaning, then, of the image of the train means, right? It, it, and this is used a lot in film, changing up the context of a particular image in order to change the meaning of that image. So now we know that they're a very loving couple. Um, uh, when these two images are combined together. We ha I have a lot more fun with this conversation in class because um, I I'm allowed to say some things in class that I probably shouldn't say in an online recording, but I think you get uh, the idea of what I'm trying to, trying to point out here. Okay, so context of a particular scene matters in helping us make meaning of that particular image or scene. There are other forms of syntax of film that we need to look at in order to make meaning of a particular scene in a film. Mise en scène, or the staging of a scene, is a particular element of a film that can contribute dramatically to the narrative of the film. Uh, mise en scène includes the sets, the props, the costumes, uh, all of the uh, details that establish the setting of the film and the scene. Um, props, uh, accents, uh, all of these things provide information about characters that aren't explicitly stated in the film. Um, they're recreating the Harry Potter sets in, in London uh, recently, and they're saying that actually so much time was spent creating the settings and the props that um, they, they have archives full of books that were created originally for Dumbledore's office and all of these things at the staging of the scene. And this dramatically shapes our idea about characters, about a narrative, about what's actually happening in a particular scene. Simply by changing the staging, we change that scene's meaning and perhaps the whole film's meaning. In The Watchmen, I love this scene in The Watchmen. This is kind of a classic uh, scene. If you haven't figured out, I like comic books. This is kind of one of those classic scenes that was pulled straight out of the comic book. This image um, is very, very close to the, the image in the original comic. Um, but if you saw The Watchmen, it's, it rains a lot in The Watchmen. The first scene, it's raining. It's dark. It's dismal. It's urban. It's dirty. It's gritty. Um, there's... Uh, uh, racial uh, integration and in fact between these two characters there's some racial tension between these two characters. Um, there's a lot going on just in the staging of this uh, particular scene and the whole film that sets the tone for the film and we know because of the setting that this is a crime ridden area um, they're going to be facing crime that may be in, in this particular point of the Watchmen that maybe the uh, vigilantes aren't really good people. Uh, maybe they're disturbed and uh, want to be criminals uh, themselves. Um, and so we, we get this idea um, about the characters uh, simply from the setting. Okay. The geographic setting, not just the props and uh, how a room looks or how a street looks, but actually where a film is set geographically uh, and symbolically help us locate a film and help us make meaning of that particular film. Um, for example, we have a, a lot of military films that have been produced, uh, The Hurt Locker, um, some other films that have been produced recently that are set in the Middle East. We know that's probably going to be a war theme. Um, we're not going to likely see a romantic comedy um, set in Darfur. 
uh, and, and anytime soon. You know, that's uh, we have a setting that lends itself to particular narrative. When we see uh, classic um, symbols of that setting, we know that that's the type of film we're going to see. When we see the Eiffel Tower, we're likely or we think we might see a romantic film, or there might be romantic elements to that film. Now, while we have had espionage films set uh, going through Paris, for the most part, particular symbols are attached to particular types of films. And right now, um, films that are set in the Middle East help us locate what that film might be about, whether it's about terrorism, uh, espionage, war, war crimes, um, those types of films, uh, that setting is important. Um, Moscow is often said, at least uh, I, I liked Gorky Park, I'm dating myself, but I love the film Gorky Park. It was set in Moscow. It was, um, uh, again centered around espionage now we might find um, references to Moscow and Russians particularly in New York that that association to Moscow is going to drop uh, uh, concepts related to the mafia uh, again urban settings related with crime now um, the geographic setting is really important because it not only shapes um, the meaning of the film from the beginning of the film, but it could also recast the whole narrative. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. By seeing a particular setting at the end of the film, the whole film takes on a new meaning. This was classically done in Planet of the Apes, and that we see a setting that seems isolated. Um, he thinks he's gone to, a, to another world, maybe another planet, and he... Um, uh, is trying to be trying to resist the authority of the apes on this new planet. Um, we come to interpret his struggle one way until the very end of the film when we realize it's actually New York City that he's been in all along. So the whole narrative is reshaped because of a symbol uh, of a setting, some place that uh, we all share, some language we all share in common. Now that's not really the Statue of Liberty, right? But we all know that that signifies the Statue of Liberty and we have a common concept that comes to mind when we see that. Okay, the weather, the time of day are also some setting related um, attributes of films that help us interpret groups, events, behavior. Uh, this was particularly true of The Dark Knight. Uh, crime uh, and crime films tend to be set at night. Um, they tend to be um, portrayed in dark, dismal, dirty places. Dark alleys tend to be used frequently um, in crime films and crime shows. Um, again, I mentioned rain, but rain is uh, used effectively to, um, if you've seen The Watchmen, uh, one of the primary characters falls from uh, uh, from his apartment building or his window, and his blood is draining into the drainage ditch um, because it's raining. Um, that's a very uh, salient scene in that film, and weather plays a big part in that. Um, so weather is used, again, a lot of times in crime films to set the mood, uh, to foreshadow a particular crime, to create meaning uh, of a crime that's going to occur, around a crime that's going to occur. Okay, some film techniques that are used, again, as language. Um, there are two particular types of sound that we look at, digetic sound uh, and non-digetic sound. Digetic sound is all of those sounds that are present in the film. Put yourself in the, in the position of the character. If the character in the film can hear the sound, um, then it's digetic sound. A phone rings and the character picks it up. Okay, that's digetic sound. The character can hear that. Um, the character can hear a car engine. The character can hear someone talking to them. Non-digetic -dig sound, though, is all of that sound that characters in the film can't hear. It's the music of foreboding that runs behind a young woman who's being stalked. It's um, the narrator who tells us in Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption um, what a Red is thinking or doing at a particular time. It's all of those sounds that originate outside the film. Uh, voiceovers, um, added enhancements to the sound, uh, explosive sounds that might not have actually occurred on the set, um, any sound that the character 
does not actually hear that is added uh, on top of the uh, character's uh, the digetic sound is called non-digetic sound. Now, Hurt Locker is an interesting example of uh, the use of digetic and non-digetic sound. Um, they were nominated for um, a Sound Academy Award. I, I don't know if it won or not, but one of the she actually won for Best Director. Uh, the director did. But uh, one of the things that made that film very interesting was that she wanted all of the the noise to be digetic. She didn't want to use non-digetic sound in the film. Now there's some in the film, but when there's an explosive, uh, an explosion in the film, there was a real explosion. And if she couldn't hear the character's dialogue, she wanted to leave that dialogue absent in the film. And her rationale was in war, if there's an explosion, you can't hear what people around you are saying. So I wanted to communicate that in the film. And she did that very well. And that's one of those examples of a film that's actually pretty unique. Most films would go back and re-record that dialogue so you could hear the dialogue over the sound effects and staging of the set, um, but she didn't. And in fact, she used digetic sound on purpose uh, to create the, a chaotic environment of war. So if you've not seen Hurt Locker, um, do that. It's a, it's, it's a great film, and um, particularly pay attention to the sound uh, that, that follows along through that film. Okay, camera work is also a technique that's often used. Um, the camera frame, the camera angle, and the camera distance all help to us to make meaning of particular characters and particular narratives. In this scene, we see that what's framed uh, is it's a it's a low angle long shot, meaning we see whenever a if you've taken a photography class or a filmmaking class, whenever the shot is shot um, down below uh, the waist of the character that's meant to um, connote power uh, or denote power. Um, it's meant to um, uh, give us thoughts of authority and respect of that particular individual. The fact that they're walking away from an explosion um, and we see them full bodied all contribute to our impressions of those characters as being authoritative uh, law enforcement officers who have the situation under control. So uh, the framing and the angle of that shot all contribute to our interpretation of the characters and the narrative. This is called a canted or a Dutch angle. Basically, it's an angle that's tilted. So we see the um, character um, from an angle, uh, again, a Dutch angle or a canted shot. Um, these types of shots are used purposefully to, again, uh, create chaos, uh, to um, create suspicion. Um, they create confusion uh, for the viewer. Uh, this is used in Do the Right Thing. We'll watch a scene from Do the Right Thing where canted angles are used very, very effectively to um, make you feel even more uncomfortable during a violent scene that's occurring. And in doubt, um, she's uh, trying to decide if, if this priest is actually abusing um, some of the children. Um, so uh, doubt uses the canted angle uh, a good deal um, to add to the mystery, the suspicion, um, the, the, again, doubt that's going on uh, throughout that film. Color uh, is often used to communicate feelings. Uh, red, we tend to associate with love or passion or fear. Um, blood is often used um, very effectively in scenes to, to bring about fear. Sometimes seeing blood even without the gore can, be, um, can, can evoke a lot of fear uh, on the part of the viewer. Uh, blues or muted tones can be used to create a calm or serene setting. Uh, grays tend to be used uh, to, uh, again, like the, the, the dark gray, desolation, isolation. Um, all of those um, ideas that come to mind when we see particular colors are used very effectively in film and very purposefully in film to um, contribute to the story of that crime. If you saw American Beauty, um, you know that uh, the roses here symbolize the fact that she was a virgin uh, at the film. That's not really articulated at the beginning of the film, but it, but it is um, towards the end. So this image has uh, meaning there. We also know that at the end of the film, 
I guess the protagonist, if you've seen American Beauty, uh, dies, and um, we see a good a good deal of blood. So there's also some foreshadowing uh, in this image as well um, to both passion and then a murder that occurs in that film. Uh, Steven Spielberg used this used red also as well to foreshadow death. Uh, if you've watched Schindler's List, and I'm sure most of you probably have, uh, whenever this little girl appears in the film, she's the only individual in the film that is colorized with red um, on top of her jacket. The entire film was shot in black and white, and then they recolored uh, her uh, clothing. Whenever she appears, um, there will be a death scene that follows uh, or an execution uh, that follows the next scene. So she's used as a foreshadowing uh, technique, and that color is used as a foreshadowing technique in Schindler's List of, of death or execution. And then we know that in Sin City, this scene occurs where he wakes up to find uh, the woman that he's been with dead. Red here, both symbolizing love and death uh, at the same time. I think the image of the um, Bible on the table is also uh, interesting and telling. I'm not sure what that uh, brings up to everyone. Maybe um, some some questioning about whether this character is good and bad, good or bad, and that's part of the theme of Sin City um, is him trying to reconcile his past and his nature and, and things like that. So there are a lot of uh, things that symbolically communicate in this scene, color being one of them. Okay, lighting. Um, I'll try to make this really brief. Um, backlighting usually creates tension, uh, suspense, the use of silhouettes, um, and we know this, the stereotypical dark stranger that's following someone around the corner is usually silhouetted. Um, we can't see their face, uh, sometimes because of lighting, sometimes because of costuming. Um, but that backlighting creates tension. Uh, hard lighting, we talked about this when I mentioned film noir. A hard, or sometimes it's called hot lighting, uh, is high visual contrast really dark darks, really bright brights, that tends to communicate a tension or a harsh setting. Sometimes I think it also communicates um, clarity uh, or it's uh, high contrast scenes are, are, are also often used to um, explore otherworldliness and some kind of psychological clarity. If you can think of the um, I'm, I'm remembering another one, uh, that, a film with Robin Williams in it, but the only one I can think of recently is the Harry Potter film, and I apologize for using so many Harry Potter examples. But um, when he's at King's Cross after uh, Harry's died, that's a very high contrast, um, but also kind of diluted scene. But there's meant to evoke something kind of um, transcendent about that. Uh, some kind of memory and uh, some type of uh, self-reflection is going on or some kind of memory is, is, is occurring during that scene. So hard lighting can be used in a couple of ways. It can be used to um, create a character that is um, harsh and cruel and mean uh, or at least suspect like in a film noir or it's also used as a technique to um, to explore someone's inner world or uh, their memories or what might happen upon death. Um, so this high contrast lighting is really interesting to watch as you watch a film and how it's used and how it's used in a particular narrative. Soft lighting is uh, typically used to emphasize uh, youth, beauty, innocence, serenity. Um, I took a lot of photography classes when I was an undergraduate, and one thing we used to do, this is really old school, again, I'm really dating myself, but we used to take Vaseline and rub it on um, a glass protective lens, and that would create um, this very diffused, uh, soft uh, look through the lens of the of the camera and oftentimes you'll see portraits done of children where there's a really soft edge uh, it's not a sharp it's not a high contrast um, it's it's a very um, serene type of um, uh, not a, a fuzzy focus uh, type of scene again that creates a mood around a character even in film noir scenes I mean film noir films sometimes the women 
would be shot with very soft lighting around their faces, while men would be shot with the harsh, high-contrast lighting. Uh, so we speak even to our expectations, our gendered expectations, uh, who's good or who's bad, based on even how lighting works within a film. Okay, again, the harsh lighting and the silhouettes were effectively used in the Maltese Falcon. Um, in fact, we can't really see the falcon in this scene except by shadow. Uh, so we see the high contrast working here to establish mystery uh, and um, the forthrightness almost of the character. Um, it continued to be used in other types of film noir. Uh, film noir uh, as a subgenre or as a genre of film um, didn't end uh, after the 40s. Uh, it's still used on occasion now stylistically. Chinatown in 74 was one of those. Um, Chinatown has some added narrative twists, but it's shot stylistically as a film noir film. And again, the harsh contrast uh, lends itself to, if, if you've seen the film, you know he's very cynical. Um, he's jaded. He's uh, beat up literally and figuratively uh, as a character, and he's really racked by um, this particular crime that's occurred uh, in the film. It's also used in The Watchmen, um, uh, kind of literally with the face of this character, uh, Rorschach. You, sh you see a film uh, noir um, style uh, cast onto him and many of the scenes that he's in much different his scenes are, are uh, the lighting and the colors are much different than some scenes with some of the other characters they, they change according to which character you watch um, and again that lends itself to tell us about the character to tell us about the story and the narrative all of these things work to help us make meaning of a film